it's my pleasure to introduce Robin Walker. Why are we here? Who's here to be inspired and grow in their knowledge? Who's here for that? Who's here for powerful black studies, black psychology information that they can use? Who's here for that? Who's here because they've got no other reason? It's almost like it was Saturday. <laughs> other people are here, absolutely. All right, now it's come to the right place. I have to respect the fact that you have been trusting me with your education for the next one hour. So I have to uh, respect that fact, and hopefully I will give you good content that you can use. Also, I have to thank the organizers, the uh, Hidden Science Academy, in particular the scientist, Mr. Leon Marshall. So big up to the Hidden Science Posse. So what is colorism? An article appeared in the Guardian, and the article said, why black people discriminate among ourselves, the toxic legacy of colorism. And then some data was given. Now, I know you can't see that, so I'm going to blow it up so that you can see it. I went deeper into my colorism research, and what I found let me know that colorism is still alive and well. I started with the marriage market and found out that dark-skinned women are less likely to be married than lighter-skinned women. But colorism shows up in even starker ways. The difference in pay rates between darker-skinned and lighter-skinned men mirrors the differences in pay between whites and blacks. Darker-skinned women are given longer prison sentences than their lighter-skinned counterparts. And this discrimination starts young. If you are a dark-skinned girl, you are three times more likely to be suspended from school than your light-skinned peers. Even more insidious, colorism even affects how we are remembered. Lighter-skinned black people are perceived to be more intelligent. Educated black people, regardless of their actual skin color, are remembered by job interviewers as having lighter skin. The daily toll of living with colorism is inescapable. Darker-skinned people report higher experiences of microaggressions. Heavier-set dark-skinned men report the highest levels of microaggressions. All of this affects our mental health and well-being. Darker-skinned women report more physiological deterioration and self-report worse health than lighter-skinned women. Taking all this into account, I cannot help to think how the weight of history comes to bear on our daily living today. What about that for some powerful information? All right, so what does this mean? Well, that's the definition that the um, uh, Guardian gave, but I'm going to critique what they've said. I say that's not the correct description of colorism. Colorism only becomes colorism if and when black people internalize and take on these dysfunctional behaviors. That's when it becomes colorism. So, who have analyzed these issues historically? Who have analyzed these issues currently? Well, historically, have you come across this book? Yes. That's the scholar who has analyzed it historically. But he didn't go far enough. If we want to trace the beginnings of colorism, we would have to start the story in prehistoric India. But because that's outside my remit, we're going to deal with who is analyzed these issues currently. And the person to do it is Dr. Franz Fanon. Monsieur Fanon was a scholar for Martinique, and he is the founder of radical black psychology. There's Monsieur Fanon. And the book that blew it up was Black Skin, White Masks. He's also the author 
of the revolutionary book, The Wretched of the Earth. So, where does Monsieur Fanon fit into our story? He is the father of black, um, black psychology. So, some of you may have come across these books, Breaking the Chains of Psychological Slavery, the ISIS Papers, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, Brainwashed, African Psychology in the American Context. All of this material goes back intellectually to where the beginning was in Monsieur Fanon and the book that he wrote in the 1950s and the 1960s. So what is psychology? It's the science of human behavior in relation to the factors that shape human behavior. And there are four such factors. There are mental factors. There are emotional factors. There are physical factors. And there are environmental factors. So what is the point of psychology? As a science, the point is to analyze behavior and predict behavior. And in this case, as we are dealing with colorism, we are going to analyze and predict dysfunctional behavior. So, psychology is a key discipline for the understanding of oneself, key discipline for the understanding of one society, key discipline for the understanding of our world. So, back to this question of who is... In the late 50s, a series of wars of liberation began. People who had been ruled by colonial powers fought to free themselves. One of the first was the Algerian Revolution, led by a Marxist group, the FLN. Out of the struggle emerged a powerful new figure, a black intellectual called Franz Fanon, who became a leading ideologist of the revolution. Fanon believed that the West exercised its control by getting inside people's minds, turning them into passive zombies. The only way for individuals to free themselves from this, he said, was through violence, including terrorism. <laughs> violence was not just a battle against the military. The very experience of the armed struggle would, Fanon said, be cathartic. It would awaken the revolutionaries from the West's insidious form of control and turn them into what he called new men. A famous film called The Battle of Algiers was made, which dramatised Fanon's ideas. This is the bit that interests Fanon, the seizure of liberty by the oppressed people. And he thought that there was something liberating about that very act of armed seizure, of defeating the enemy, and uh, the, the self-respect which would arise from an autonomous struggle of that kind. constructing the new man entirely, the freed, out of this struggle, uh, as if, you know, the traumas of the past, of previous relations, could be wished away, the re as if the Revolutionary War would be a sort of blanking out of everything, and a, a complete tabula rasa, start again from the beginning. <laughs> ideas was a very specific Western idea of freedom. The existential ideas of the philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. Fanon had been educated in Paris in the 1950s and had become a friend of Sartre's. And he had been deeply influenced by Sartre's idea that individuals are trapped in a narrow and bleak idea of freedom by the pressures of the society around them. To achieve true freedom, Sartre said, had to find ways to break through this illusion. And what Fanon did was turn this idea into a revolutionary theory. And his ideas became the guiding force behind nearly all the third world revolutions of the 60s and the 70s. They inspired Che Guevara, Yasser Arafat, and Steve Biko in South Africa. So did we know this? Monsieur Fanon's ideas were the guiding principles why most of the third world countries are now free from European rule. Did we know this? Yeah. Well, you must be told. All right, now, 
What are we going to be dealing with in today's session? Well, the program is this. I would explain how colonial powers brainwash conquered people. I'm also going to show how these ideas analyze and predict dysfunctional behavior amongst oppressed people whose psychologies have been distorted and manipulated by colonial powers. Is everyone happy with this? Because it means we're going to be going deep. Now what normally happens is, is everyone's cool until I say something that hits the nerve. key ideas behind Fanon's book, Black Skins, White Masks. Key idea. However painful it may be for me to accept this conclusion, I'm ob obliged to state it. For the black man, there is only one destiny, and it is white, says Monsieur Fanon. Now, what the hell does he mean by that? He means that once people have been brainwashed, Everything that they do of value ends up being in a brainwashed direction. So you end up undermining other black people, you end up tripping other black people up, and you end up, your behavior becomes in service of European domination. Even if that wasn't your intention. Does that make sense? All right, so in what way will black people behave to ensure a white destiny? Can we produce a list? All right, anyone want to shout some ideas out? The kind of things that under colonial mentality, black people end up doing to undermine themselves, undermine each other, and help white supremacy. Being a vanguard for the white supremacy. That's one way of doing it, yes, sir. Suppressing each other, good. degree of masters, if it wasn't black studies, everything else you studied was Eurocentric propaganda. All right, so how does this play out in the real world? See, black men hate one another. And many of them publicly declared this. And when a rapper says, I will kill that nigger, this makes it very clear he hates black people. I never used to see it that way, but it's clear. How I know this is when I go into prisons and young boys write these kind of lyrics and I say to them, well, my mum's white, my dad's black. If I write a song saying I'm going to go out and kill honkies and crackers and whitey tomorrow, what do you think about it? Without exception, every single black boy I've said that to say, no, you can't do that, that's racist. No. The same boy who two minutes ago just said I'm going to blow a nigga's head off when I see him, has told me he values white life infinitely more than he values black life. See, because we tend to think that you have to be white to be a white supremacist, that's ridiculous. Some of the worst white supremacists I know are black. That's the one, the only good thing I found about the Django film was Samuel Jackson's character. Right? That Uncle Rucker's character is real. There are black people that hate blackness. So what Akana said there, is that a contributory factor to black youth crime? Is it targeting other black people because you hate other black people because you've been brainwashed to hate other black people? All right, now, second idea behind Monsieur Fanon's book, Black Skins, White Masks. The Negro of the Antilles, that means the Caribbean, will be proportionately whiter, that is, he will come closer to being a real human being in direct ratio to his mastery of the French language. 
I am not unaware that this is one of man's attitudes face to face with being. A man who has a language consequently possesses the world expressed and implied by that language. What we are getting at becomes plain. Mastery of the language affords remarkable power. Paul Valery knew this, what he called language, the God gone astray in the flesh. In a work now in preparation, I propose to investigate this phenomenon. For the moment, I want to show why the Negro of the Antilles, whoever he is, has always to face the problem of language. Furthermore, I will broaden the field of this description and through the Negro of the Antilles include every colonized man, every colonized people. In other words, every people in whose soul an inferiority complex has been created by the death and burial of its local cultural originality finds itself face to face with the language of the civilizing nation that is, with the culture of the mother country. The colonized is elevated above his jungle status in proportion to his adoption of the mother country's cultural standards. <coughs> so, question, how did French become the language of dominance, the language of etiquette, the language of power in Martinique? Not a trick question, simple question. Does that make sense? 
Now, how does Fanon's notion of proportions and ratios affect Martinique people's relationship to French culture? Proportions and ratios. There are going to be some people in Martinique that swallow Parisian culture whole. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then you're going to have some people that have got maybe a quarter French in the culture, three quarters Martinique. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then you're going to have some people where it's half. And then you're going to have the people that practice the remnants of African culture in Martinique. Mm -hmm. And how are they going to be seen by everybody else? Is everyone going to look up to them? Is everyone going to say, well, I like what you're doing. We need to be jumping on that. Everyone is going to diss those people who practice African culture. Are we feeling it? Mm -hmm. And then the ratio of disses depends on how deep you are into the black culture. Are we understanding how it works? Now, is that true of every colonized people? Yeah. Absolutely. It's the same structure. It's the same model. And with the people at the bottom, it's the same shame that they're encouraged to feel. Are we understanding this? Now, here's a big question. Is colonization the only thing that produces those outcomes? If you read Fanon's book, he says colonization. Is that the only thing that produces those outcomes? No. Slavery. Slavery produced exactly the same outcomes. Now, what can we predict about how the different proportions and ratios of colonial slave language use will affect the way that people behave towards each other? So if we take, for example, colonial Jamaica, and you are just a Patois speaker. So that means you're going to get a job in the bank, right? Is that how it works? No, that's not going to happen. Uh, has anyone heard, the, I think her name was Una Martha, someone correct me. Has anyone ever heard that woman speak? What does she sound like? She sounded like the Queen. Does that make sense? She sounded just like the Queen. And at one time, she was the, the leading Caribbean broadcaster. And then that became the accent, do you see? And then what there would then be would be this sliding scale of accents for the people at the top to the Creole and speakers at the bottom. Are we understanding how this thing works? Now, what can we predict about how the different proportions and ratios of colonial and slave culture affected the oppressed people and how they behave towards each other? It'll be the same thing, right? Those that have imbibed European culture will be at the top, those that practice African culture will be at the bottom, and those that practice African culture will be encouraged to feel ashamed of themselves and don't bring that backward uh, uh, thing in this room. Does that make sense? Now, everyone is acting as if everyone's cool with it. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's deal with traditional African religion. At this point, some people are starting to consider that they believe in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is it a shame of traditional African religion? Those of you that studied religion will know that traditional African religion is the parent of all Western religions. But you've been so told to be ashamed of it, yeah? I bring up traditional African religion, everyone is thinking Obia, everyone is thinking Juju, and they want to be outside the room. Can you see what a number the colonialists this did on your psychology? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what were the other key ideas? Let me give you another key idea that Monsieur Fanon talks about. Oh, I want you to meet my black friend. Aimé César, a black man and a university graduate. Marion Anderson, the finest of Negro singers. Dr. Cobb, who invented white blood, is a Negro. Hey, say hello to my friend from Martinique. Be careful, he's extremely sensitive. Shame, shame, and self-contempt, nausea. When people like me, they tell me it is in spite of my color. When they dislike me, they point out that it is not because of my color. Either way, I am locked into an infernal circle. I turn away from these inspectors of the ark before the flood, and I attach myself to my brothers, Negroes like myself. To my horror, they too reject me. So, who wants to explain how did blackness become a curse? Who wants to explain it? Simple things? That's not the origins of it, though. What's the origins of it? Um, from the, the perception of the dark skin, people, uh, people have. Yeah. No, very simple.
simple. This is how black skin got cursed. We got conquered. Someone pointed a gun at you. Does that make sense? And then all of a sudden, your appearance becomes negative. Then the stuff in the Bible about Ham was then twisted to reinforce that. Does that make sense? And then all systems of propaganda were then reinforced. You do realize that schooling is propaganda. Yes. You do realize that university is propaganda. Yes. You do realize that the mass media is propaganda. Yes. Are we understanding this? Yes. So what started it is when someone points a gun at you. Are we understanding this? Yeah. Right? So that is how blackness became a curse. Now, is that true of every colonized people? Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Now, what it is, is because we black, we like to talk about these issues. There are some ethnic groups that don't talk about it. But their problems are even worse. Now, here's where it gets dark. And this is where some people are going to want to leave the room. Does Fanon's notion of ratios and proportions work here? All right, let's test this idea of ratios and proportions. Can we predict how the different proportions and ratios of colonial and slave blood affects the way oppressed people behave towards each other? Yes, I'm going there. That means there are going to be some people that are completely pure, where all their ancestors were black, as far as we know. No slave blood, no colonial era blood. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have some people with traces, a few percent. Then you're going to have some people where it's 5%, some people where it's 10%, some people where it's 20%, some people where it's 30%, some people where it's 40%. Does that make sense? And it's going to start showing up either in your hair, your features, or your coloring. Does that affect how oppressed people behave towards each other? Yes. Now, not just among blacks. This is the racial hierarchy in Mexico. White Mexicans are at the top. Amerindians, that means Native American peoples, are at the bottom. And then in between, you've got the mestizos, part white, part Native American. Does that make sense? And then... The, the diagram has split the mestizos into those that are mixed and light-skinned and those that are mixed and dark-skinned. In other words, you can't pretend you don't know what's going on. Does that make sense? In the United States and most of the Western world, we think that having a tan is attractive. We want to be out in the sun to make our skin darker. In Asia, especially here in Thailand, it's the opposite. The one who has a white skin, the one who looks the beautiful for the boys' eyes. Many women and even men are obsessed with making themselves as white as possible. That's why you'll see people with umbrellas when it's sunny outside to retain their whiteness. This is all for white just walk inside any cosmetic or skincare store and you'll see shelves and shelves of whitening cream. Oh, is there some mask? Yes. With ghostly white models staring back at you. This one you have to take, this one for two or three times for a week. Is that the one that you use? Yes, it's for your armpits. But nobody looked at your armpits, uh... But here, they're very concerned about their armpits. Yes. Are you concerned about your armpits? Yes, of course. Some people take pills to make their skin whiter, while others use cream, lasers, and even surgeries, paying big money. In a recent report found on Business Insider, Asians spent over 20 billion US dollars a year to look pale. So what can we conclude from this? What, what conclusions can we draw? It's not just black people. The same system is global. And again, me bringing the pain. All right, you know that in this country, you've got two groups of white people primarily. You've got Celts and you've got Anglo-Saxon Jutes. The Anglo-Saxon Jutes are the English, the Celts are the Highland Scots and the Irish. What's the distinguishing trait or what's a distinguishing trait of the Highland Scots and the Irish? Ginger hair. Now, are ginger-haired children bullied to this day? Yes. 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 Right. So you can see then that this is not just a black thing. 
This is a colonial thing producing the same results everywhere. So, so far, I've shown you about the Asian uh, uh, skin lightening industry. The dysfunction didn't stop there. But there's a place where it's even more extreme, a plastic surgery mecca where 7.5 million people have traveled to go under the knife. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam, the ritzy district in Seoul, South Korea that Sai put on the map. It's full of Korean women seemingly trying to emulate the doll-like features of these K-pop girls in Sai's video. And in bands like Girls' Generation. A staggering one in five South Korean women has had plastic surgery. The streets lined with hundreds of clinics. And 19-year-old Christina here is about to join those ranks. It's a normal thing. It's not like you're getting plastic surgery. It's, it's like you're getting plastic surgery. Congratulations. Wow. My friends, they would actually just go on vacation and then they would come back with a new face. So you literally have friends who you know yeah. but you don't recognize. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. She'll be getting surgery to slim down her jaw and another to reshape her nose. Christina has appeared occasionally as a translator on Korean TV and has aspirations of making broadcasting her career. But she also feels the pressure to make some serious changes first. I got lots of hate comments like, why is she even on TV? Like, why? Why is she so fat? I don't have the looks. I don't have that idol figure. I don't have that face. Do you feel like, though, you're doing it just to fit in? And look like everybody else? I guess everyone wants to look like K-pop idols. You have to look pretty, you have to have double eyelids, you have to have your V-line face, you have to have um, big breasts and stuff. In Korea, like, you go down the street, you see this girl, and you walk down the street, and you see that girl again, but actually it is a different person. Because everybody looks, looks so same. identical. Yeah. Wow. All right, so they made it quite clear. Three things. Double eyelid surgery to do what? Change an Asian eye into a European eye. Second thing, have the face slimmed down, which means have those uh, cheekbones uh, cut down to change the face shape. And then the third thing is the V chin to turn the chin into a European chin. Are we feeling this? So what does this mean for us? It means for us, colorism is more than skin color. It's three things. It's tightness of hair curl. It's broadness of feature. And it's skin color. Does that make sense? Tightness of hair curl. OK, so what were the key ideas behind black skin's white masks? Again, let's read on. Professor D. Westerman in The African Today says, the Negro's inferiority complex is particularly intensified amongst the most educated, who must struggle with it unceasingly. Their way of doing so, he adds, is frequently naive. The wearing of European clothes, whether rags or the most up-to-date style, using European furniture and European forms of social intercourse, adorning the native language with European expressions using bombastic phrases in speaking or writing a European language. All these contribute to a feeling of equality with the European and his achievements. So, how has colonization then affected the behavior of middle class blacks? You see, a middle class black is different to a working class black because a working class black has not undergone as much Eurocentric education. You see, the middle class black has, a, has undergone more Eurocentric education and is therefore more prone to Eurocentric beliefs and ideologies. Does that make sense? And this idea that if it's European, it's the bomb. Now, let's see how that plays out. But again, is this true of every colonized people? Is it? Absolutely. Every colonized person behaves the same when it comes to this issue. And I'm going to show you an example of how it plays out today in Congo, Central Africa. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, a group of fashionistas is taking style to a new level. They're known as supporters, the Society of Ambience Makers, 
and elegant people. They are obsessed with designer labels and are well known around town in Kinshasa. CPTN's Chris Ochamwenda has more. It's showtime in this Kinshasa neighborhood of Lemba. These are the surfers. Dressing in the most fashionable clothes is their obsession. With European designers, their favorite. Did and you hear that? The surfers, it's a serious pastime. Some people disregard us as a bunch of jokers, but I'm warning them to change that attitude because the clothes I wear are equivalent to the price of some of the houses they live in. Their large coats may appear ill suited for Kinshasa's hot weather, much to the amusement of onlookers, but they love showing off their labels. One of the philosophies of the Safair is that they'll always be happy people, even if they don't have any food to eat, because the designer clothes they put on serves as food to their soul. The Safair movement sprang up in the 1950s as a result of French influence in Central Africa. It was later popularized by musicians like Papa Wemba, who passed away in 2016. Some of the Safairs struggle to make ends meet because they spend a lot on buying clothes. Others use their businesses to subsidize their hobby. I spend so much on clothes because I earn a lot from selling diamonds. The designer clothes are sometimes bought from second-hand stores in Kinshasa or sourced from relatives abroad. It's a society of fashion lovers dominated by men, but there are women members too, like Barbara Cassendi, who joined in 1999 and has never looked back. I'm an ardent suffuse. It's a culture that makes my life worth living. I work very hard in my pub to get money to buy these expensive clothes. And with no expense spared, for these affairs, it's about enjoying life and doing so in style. Chris Ochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. All right, so more key ideas behind black skin, white masks. It was always the Negro teacher, the Negro doctor. Brittle as I was becoming, I shivered at the slightest pretext. I knew, for instance, that if the physician made a mistake, it would be the end of him and of all those who came after him. What could one expect, after all, from a Negro physician? As long as everything went well, he was praised to the skies. But look out, no nonsense under any conditions. The black physician can never be sure how close he is to disgrace. I tell you, I was walled in. No exception was made for my refined manners, or my knowledge of literature, or my understanding of quantum theory. Now, does that explain why middle-class blacks are more likely to be sellouts? Because a middle-class black knows you slip up once, that's the end of you, that's the end of everyone coming after you, you know, you done know. Okay, another key idea behind black skins, white masks. Satan is black. One talks of shadows. When one is dirty, one is black whether one is thinking of physical dirtiness or of moral dirtiness. It would be astonishing if the trouble were taken to bring them all together, to see the vast number of expressions that make the black man the equivalent of sin. In Europe, whether concretely or symbolically, the black man stands for the bad side of the character. As long as one cannot understand this fact, one is doomed to talk in circles about the black problem. Blackness, darkness, Shadow, shades, night, the labyrinths of the earth, abysmal depths, blacken someone's reputation, and on the other side, the bright look of innocence, the white dove of peace, magical heavenly light, a magnificent blonde child. How much peace there is in that phrase, how much joy, and above all, how much hope. There is no comparison with the magnificent black child. Wow. Did they even manipulate the image of God? Did they even manipulate the <coughs> image of the devil in the way we think? Wow. Has anyone seen this? No one's seen this. It's on my Facebook feed. This is a crypt in a church in Ghana. 
quite serious, a crypt in a church in Ghana, and can you see the white angel is killing a black devil? And that is in a black church in Ghana. Just let that sink in. All right, another key idea. The Tarzan stories, the sagas of 12-year-old explorers, the adventures of Mickey Mouse, and all those comic books serve actually as a release for collective aggression. The magazines are put together by white men for little white men. This is the heart of the problem in the Antilles, Caribbean. And there is every reason to think that the situation is the same in the other colonies. These same magazines are devoured by the local children. In the magazines, the wolf, the devil, the evil spirit, the bad man, the savage are always symbolized by Negroes or Indians. Since there is always identification with the victor, the little Negro, quite as easily as the little white boy, becomes an explorer, an adventurer, a missionary who faces the danger of being eaten by the wicked Negroes. So is this how the culture of European supremacy duplicates itself from generation to generation? Is that how it's done? And those scholars that have gone there, like Professor Amos Wilson, have come with a counter strategy, teaching black parents the developmental psychology of the black child and what you can do step by step to checkmate this. So how's it done today? They don't use comics, although they're still around. This is how it's done today. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. That's how it's done today. All right, so conclusion. Is speaking a backward language, practicing a backward culture, and having a cursed appearance affected all colonized and enslaved people equally, would there be a problem? Who says yes? Yes, because. However, is speaking a backward language, practicing a backward culture, and having a cursed appearance affected all colonized and enslaved people in different proportions and in different ratios? Do we have a problem? <laughs> Do you understand the difference? The first example is racism. The second example is racism plus colorism. Are we understanding this? By the way, you have to like that graphic right there. Do <laughs> you like that graphic? Yeah. Okay, so guess what? It's the next slide. Everyone needs to get up. Okay, so the next one is like this. Right, someone has stood to sat down two or three people, that person. Everyone looks like this. Okay, so it's stretched in this way. Okay, it's stretched in this way. Okay, now we're going to get dark. We're now going to apply the Fanon model. What we're going to do is we're going to think of some notional situations and we're going to compare the behavior of black people whose behavior has been seriously affected by colonial supremacy. And we're going to apply this notion of in proportion. Now, I know what some people are going to say. Some people are going to say, but Robin, I've read Fanon, and I don't behave like this. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people who haven't read Fanon and who do behave like this. Are we understanding this? And I'm going to ask the question, who won in this situation? Okay, so our first example, lateness behavior. 
Controversial, so I'm going to explain it to you. Um, anyone here who's a school teacher will be able to validate what I've just said. If you're a school teacher and you're black, which kids and which parents are going to give you the most lip? There's going to be black children and black parents. Does that make sense? And uh, anyone that works in the nursing profession, which people, as uh, patients, are going to give black nurses the most lip. It's going to be black patients. Does that make sense? Uh, again, people are going to try and front. People are going to try and style it out, but you can't fool your own club. No point in fronting. No point in styling it out, because I know how it goes. All right, now, how would Fanon have analyzed this event? An event took place. Michael Dosunmu gunman jail for mistaken identity killing. Let me explain what happened in this story. Uh, Michael uh, Dosunbu's brother was a gangster. Does that make sense? He was a gangster, his brother was. And what happened was the gang robbed a group of people and then they had a meeting point that they were supposed to come back and meet. Does that make sense? And share out what was stolen. And then when he came to the meeting point, and the other gangsters came to share out. They said that they didn't leave with anything. So there's nothing to share out. Does that make sense? We're with this. So the gangsters that uh, scam, uh, the gangsters tried to scam the other gangsters out of what was stolen. Are we understanding this? So the gangsters that got scammed decided, okay, we're gonna shoot. You, you see? And they ended up getting the wrong person. Instead of shooting the gangster that skanked them, they shot Michael Dosunbu. Are you feeling this? Yeah. yeah? So we're going to use a fan on analysis. Would his brother have skanked white gangsters? No. No. Now, see, people are going to try and front. Don't front. Yeah? Don't front. You don't know. They would not have tried to scout white gangsters. And I'm going to prove it in one minute. Hold, hold me to that. One minute? I said, I'm going to prove it to you in one minute. Next, if a white gangster had scouted the gang, would the others have shot him, yes or no? No. Don't front. You see, what happens is, if people tell me that robbing black gangsters are the baddest, they don't care. Really? Really? Why is that guy still alive? Why is he alive? See, this is the bottom line. Black gangsters are, I can't even use that word. Black gangsters are wannabes. They're fakes. They're only bad when it comes to killing black people. And there's the proof. All right, inter and intra-ethnic examples. All right, so now we're going to bring up the shade thing. Domestic violence. 
Yes, I'm going there. Right, now, imagine we have an out of control, crazy black man, and he beats women. Yes? So we've established he's crazy, we've established he's a beater. Does that make sense? But does it mean then that all the partners get the same amount of mix? No. Right, once we then bring in our non-black spouses or black spouses, who's going to get the most mix? No. The black spouse. Are we understanding this? Okay. Now let's bring in now our color and shade system. Are we feeling this? Okay, so the spouse, if the coloring is over here, are they going to get the same amount as if the coloring is over here? No. no. Does that make sense? Again, people are going to try and front. Don't front. Here's why. Have we seen that book? Yes. What's it about? What's it about? Right, now. Right, and how she got called ugly, we don't need to know anything more. What does that tell you about what she looks like? Dark skinned and African looking. Yes? Yeah. Are we clear? Mm -hmm. Now, loving and caring for children. Do all children get the same amount of love in a black home? Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Now, is it then the same if the child is over here? It's the same as if the child's over here, right? Right? <laughs> yeah, you probably know what it is. Does that make sense? No. Rather more than that. Disciplining children. Do children over here get the same amount of mix as children over here? But is your family standard? Really? So if I was to go to every member of your family, it would be the same situation. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Generally speaking, it works in three ways. If a child is dark skinned, they get more mix. If a child has got tightly curled hair, they get more mix. And if a child has got broad features, they get more mix. And if the child is dark skinned, and they've got tightly curled hair, and they've got broad features, they're gonna get even more mix than everybody else. Does that make sense? Now, some people say, but that doesn't happen in my household. It might not be your household. You're gonna have relatives. And you don't know that's going to be happening. If it doesn't happen there, it's going to happen somewhere in that circle. Are we understanding this? Now, as the head of a Saturday school, those of you that don't know, I head a Saturday school in South London. Um, I know that I have to protect my staff. And I know that the most vulnerable staff I have are the darkest skin staff. Because I know that light skinned parents don't like dark skinned teachers telling their children off. And I know that my dark-skinned teachers are going to be the first to be complained about. And of course, it's not just dark skin. What else is it? It's tightly curled hair. It's broad features. All right, so let's bring it now to the subject that you all want to hear about. Can these ideas be applied to dating? Do you think they could be applied? Hmm. Could these ideas be applied to choice of D-U-F-F? -F? Do you know what D-U-F-F -F is? No. Designated ugly fat friend. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Designated fat friend. When it comes to dating, if you have an attractive person, they want someone to be seen with to set off the attractiveness of against this person. And that person is called a designated ugly fat friend. Now, here's the point. Don't front that you don't know what I'm talking about. Don't front. But beauty is subjective, right. and we're all beautiful. Now, once you know what goes on, you now know who someone is going to pick to be the D-U-F-F, don't you? It's worse than that. Does it uh, uh, affect the choice of guy who's gonna end up in the friend zone? Does that, is it gonna play out that way too? Does that make sense? 
Okay, friend zone. This is the guy that a woman will keep around. They call that person a beta orbiter. A beta orbiter is like you've got a planet, and you've got That's a beta orbiter. It's not easy at all. And that person is never going to be the boyfriend, but the woman gives him enough prompts so that he's led to think at some point he's going to be the boyfriend. Now, the question now is, does skin color, tightness of hair curl, and broadness of feature decide who's going to end up in the DUFF category and who's going to end up in the friend zone? <coughs> could these ideas be applied to marriage? Do you think they could be applied? Could these ideas be applied to mating? Yes, I'm going there. You see, one of the considerations of mating isn't do you like the other person? That's not the consideration. It's what do you want your children to look like? Do you want them dark skin? Do you want them with tight to curl hair? Do you want them with broad features? And does that affect the choice of person? Next question. Are we living in parallel universes? Right, let me explain. One of the things about being a black studies tutor is uh, I'm in touch with a lot of my students, especially my male students, and they will tell me things. And the kind of things that they tell me, this is what I realized for the first time, dark-skinned people and light-skinned people are living in parallel universes. Trust me. If you're a light-skinned guy, the amount of uh, women that are willing to be nice, the ratios are very different to if you're a dark-skinned guy. Right? Next. Because a light-skinned guy is light-skinned, and a lot of women want children a certain way, yep. light-skinned guys will tell me this. A lot of women will tell them they don't want condoms. Straight from the, straight from the gate. And I'm thinking, I'm missing this vision. Yeah, is that how they behave? Because they don't behave like that around me. <laughs> <laughs> We're running a course in Croydon. I know this is a long way from Croydon, but people can get there. We're running a course called Black History, Personal Empowerment, and African Cultural Studies, where we're teaching history, political studies, sociology, psychology. What you've seen today is a typical psychology class. Right? Our religion, science and technology, business and economics. Right? And you get out of the course, you get to study with like-minded adults, your knowledge will enable you to address problems in our community. Learning your culture will skyrocket your confidence and self-esteem. Your interest in all areas of human culture will dramatically increase. And you will have a vast reserve of information to help yourself and pass it on to your children. All right, so logistics. Our course is in Croydon, Croydon Supplementary Education Project. Um, I'm one of three lecturers on the course. It's in Croydon, 32 to 34 Sydney Road, CRO2EF. Saturdays, 4 till 6. The very first class was today. But if you joined, this is how we do it. We do 18, we do 18, we do 18. Does that make sense? So if you join, say, next week or the week after, you can start with class 2, do class 18, and then do 1. Does that make sense? If you started the week after, you start with class 3, do the 18, and then 1. Does that make sense? Our, our, our course is £147 for the 18 weeks. If you're interested, speak to me and I can give you an application form. And <laughs>